to another episode of Relics Radio. This is a family-friendly show, so the entire family can join us as we talk metal detecting, relic, and treasure hunting. You can also call into the show at 270-495-0315 or join in the chat and post any comments or questions you might have. Relics Radio is also now syndicated on the Cutting Edge Radio Network, and is broadcast around the world. You're listening to Relics Radio of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. And it is Thursday night again, and you are listening to Relics Radio world-famous Relics Radio here coming out of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. want to welcome all of our live listeners, and I see that we're filling up on the Spreaker app here. Also, want to welcome all of our syndicated listeners that are coming in through the Cutting Edge Radio Network. I can't see you, but you know who you are, and we know that you're there, and we certainly do appreciate it. But not everybody can catch the show live, and so we want to thank all of our Archive listeners that either pick that up on Spreaker.com, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Podbean, uh, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that there are podcasts, we are there. And I am your host, Digging with Seven. And I'm your co-host, Tennessee Jeff. Uh, Sorry I missed last week, but uh, got to uh, drop in my stepdaughter off at college and Buddy, that turned out to be an adventure. Uh, and any any parents ever drop their kid off at college, I thought it was just going to be, well, send you out the truck door and then uh, here's your stuff. See you later. But no, it didn't happen that way. So no, uh, I was there pretty much uh, twelve hours the whole day. So it was an adventure. And after all the tears and stuff got done, we made it home. So. Well, don't worry about that because we dropped all of ours off and they come back home. So <laughs> they'll be back. Oh, no, and they bring more with them too. Uh, sure. I'm a little bit concerned about half redneck down there, though. As most of you know, uh, there is a hurricane coming in, and uh, it's going to just about uh, hit dead center if it doesn't change uh, where Mark is at around the Orlando area. So our thoughts and prayers are with everybody that are on the coast down there in Florida. Aren't aren't they, Jeff? They sure are. And, uh, of course, I was talking about uh, talking to Mark earlier about uh, going down there after the storm. And then he said, well, let's just hope we survive the storm first. And then, uh, of course, I didn't realize how big it was going to be until after Mark said something. But it's going to be a uh, uh, Category 4 the way they talk when it hits the landfall. So, I mean, it's going to. It's going to be a big storm, and, I mean, uh, prayers to everybody. Yeah, somebody is, uh, no doubt about it, somebody is going to uh, suffer damage, you know, with a Category 4. And, uh, you know, I guess the most devastating one that came through was Andrew that came through kind of south and just cut across uh, Florida, and I think got out in the Gulf and then turned and come back across. But anyway, uh, we uh, were thinking about all of you folks that are down there on the uh, on what they call the Treasure Coast there, and uh, you know, there will be some good hunting though. There'll be some cuts where that thing uh, comes <laughs> in and moves a little bit of sand. Yeah, they sure will. There'll be some cuts for sure, but uh, uh, we'll we'll see how it goes after it uh, makes landfall and uh, gets on out of the state of Florida and, and uh, see how everything is down there before uh, we start heading down that way. So. And I see that uh, Paul Forsay is on here, and he said that his son just moved to Melbourne, and so uh, we'll be thinking about him as well. And by the way, tell Gail I said congratulations on uh, winning that prize uh, Monday night there, Paul. Uh, appreciate her calling in. Didn't know if we was ever going to give the thing away, but well, she finally called in, and that was, that was great. Uh, she got tickets to uh, Pound the Ground. Uh, free on our uh, show on Monday night uh, Relic Roundup. So that that was great. 
Uh, we've got a great guest tonight here on Relics Radio, don't we, Jeff? Go ahead and bring we him sure, in. Uh, we sure do. I, I can't wait. He, uh, we met him in uh, uh, Chattanooga this year, and I mean, he's a great guy. And uh, Rick Ward, come on in here. How you doing, Rick? Well, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Guys, how are you? Uh, we're great. We're great. Fair and middling. And the one thing that I can <laughs> one thing that I can say about Rick is that uh, you know I wish he would want to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's what, when I found out was a few months ago when we was going to have him on this show. I was like, well, hey, Rick's going to be great. We won't have to talk none. We can just let him carry on the show. <laughs> of course, this is your show, Rick. This is all about you. So yeah. Oh Lord, it is tonight. That's, now that's you know you you've been a uh, you've been a regular caller, and and by the way. Guys, we appreciate people calling in to the show. We normally don't uh, we normally don't open up the phone lines until after we get past. Our show is syndicated, uh, distributed through several outlets uh, out of Arizona for like the first 57, 58 minutes. And so we normally don't like to take calls then because uh it kind of breaks the flow of the of the show for syndicated listeners and everything of course we like it here on this end well we just two and a half rednecks with metal detectors but uh (laughs) anyway uh we love your calls and we we're looking forward to some calls tonight and by the way we've got a prize package that we're going to give out uh some of that was provided by rick some of that was provided by kelly co and some of that package was provided by detectees.com so here's what you need to do you need to sit back enjoy yourself listen to the show because we're going to ask the trivia question uh around the top of the hour or something and then you're going to have to call in to the show and give us the answer to two questions uh, both related to the same topic that will come up sometime during the show tonight. So we're excited about giving stuff away, ain't we, Rick? You bet. Boy, I tell you, I, I want to sit back and listen to the show, too. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do that. You can't do that. I know. Yeah. Uh, I know. Go ahead and kick things off here for us. Uh, a lot of people don't know you that are listening here. They they may have heard you or something. Uh, but just give us a little bit of background on Rick Ward, your early life, your family history on the farm, how you got started in metal detecting. Just just give us all your secrets. Why don't you say about that? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's kind of hard to begin sometimes. Um, you know, I was I was raised um, in Texas, and we've got a farm that has been in my family well over 100 years. It was a wedding present to my great-grandparents. And um, <clears throat> I grew up there. My, my grandmother, there was uh, five sisters in that that whole clan of, of girls that grew up there on that farm. And, uh, they kind of all moved off and, uh, kind of after a while moved back and my mom decided to move out there. My grandmother had given her a parcel of land on that, that farm. And, uh, it just, you know, that's where I spent my childhood days. There's uh there's ranches kind of surrounding it. There's a big lake surrounding it. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a kid's paradise. And so, yeah, I grew up working cattle and horses and uh, <clears throat> just uh, being involved in, in the rodeo business and just doing everything that a kid would ever dream about doing that was, you know, growing up in Texas, I guess. And um, just really, you know, uh, the history there is so, so rich. Um, I used to hear stories about, you know, Mexican bandits and Indians and fights and so i you know even even john lafitte the treasure of john lafitte i i went looking for it when i was a kid so <laughs> there was a lot of a lot of stuff there man it, it sounds like a great place it sounds like a uh a, a man's paradise or either a, wo- a woman or a man's paradise with the big lake and a lot of land so uh how did you get into uh metal detecting i mean uh, uh what got you into metal detecting treasure hunter that's kind of a funny story. Um, there, there's kind of two parts to that. My cousin, who lives in Arkansas, he it's like he had a new hobby. Every every summer he'd come down, and they would spend a week or two um, at the farm. And um, he, every it, it was he was always bringing something. And one summer he brought a metal detector, and so I had to have one. I mean, it was the neatest thing I'd ever seen. And 
So I went and hit all these pawn shops and I was probably, I think I was 16 at that time. And, um, so we went and hit all these pawn shops and, and I found, uh, an old bounty hunter. I think it was, um, seemed to me like it was like a gold seeker. I mean, it was just a big metal box with a bunch of batteries and, and had a meter on there. And it, that was it. I mean, you could hear tones. I didn't think it had headphones. It wasn't a place to plug them in on that particular model, I don't think. But uh, we uh, we set out to find treasure, and lo and behold, um, I I got spoiled right away. Hmm. What what kind of finds? Uh, I can't. Oh, you got everybody's suspense <laughs> going. <laughs> yeah, you you just stopped, and everybody was like, "Huh?" Well, you know, I okay. So I was um, there's a ranch that is across the road from where our farm was now. There's a difference between a farm and a ranch. We had a couple hundred acres, and the ranch was several thousand acres. But uh, the creek that runs through the middle of this ranch was actually named after my uh, great-grandfather's family. And uh, we had heard stories, you know, growing up. So we set out to go find buried treasure, and uh, we get over there and start hunting this hillside. And, and uh, my cousin, you know, being the guy he is, he, we took all these flags and We'd get a signal and we'd stick a flag in the ground, get a signal. So we had 20 or 30 flags in there. And I told him, I said, I'll work this half. You work that half. And um, so my first find ever, first thing I ever dug up was a stove plate from the 1800s. It was like the center uh, where the pot belly stove where the burner would mm-hmm. go on either side of it. Uh, and it was stamped 1800 and something, 1880 or something like that and so um i go to my next flag and i dig it up and it's long and the whole time i'm thinking man i'd love to find a gun i'd love to find a gun and so i start hitting this piece of pipe or what i think is a piece of pipe and i start digging and i'm digging and lo and behold i pull out a double barrel coach gun and so i go to my next signal <laughs> it's a musket. <laughs> so I, I, found a, I found a double barrel shotgun and a musket in the same, you know, um, and I'm running around in circles. I mean, I must have looked really funny because I'm just screaming, I found a gun, I found a gun. And, you know, my cousin, he's just, he's just eating it up because he'd been metal detecting much longer than I had. But, um, and then, I found just tons of stuff that, you know, we found some pocket watches and, you know, jewelry, just different things um, on that piece of property. And and come to find out there was some kind of a little skirmish that happened there and some people were robbed back in the 1800s. I think some bandits had come through that little gulch where we were at and um, robbed the settlers. So what so what kind of, part of what part of Texas is this at? I mean, is it uh, central? I mean, I know you don't want to give away the exact location. It's, it's actually in, it's in East Texas. It's at No Telling Creek, Texas. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Does your family still own that No, no Telling Creek? <laughs> no Telling Creek. <laughs> actually, you know, uh, sad enough, the, the man that owned that ranch. I um, in my adult years, I actually worked on that ranch as a kid. And uh, later on in my my adult years, early uh, adult life in my twenties, I was the ranch foreman and um, took care of uh, five hundred head of um, uh, Hereford cattle for him, and um, did all the you know the branding and the separating and calving and all that stuff. But he just recently passed away, and, um, and but as far as the land that that our farm is still on, we still own. A bunch of it um a lot of it got sold off over the years you know even before my life and my mom's life my grand you know my great-grandfather there was like when the lake was built you know they forced him to sell because there's you can't own property on a publicly owned lake and there's just a lot of logistics but for the most part we can still go out there and hunt um i'm still friends with the family of of the ranch owner as of right now i don't know if they're going to sell the ranch or what's going to happen, but I'm trying to get back to Texas so I can try to hunt it now that I have some really updated equipment, so to speak. <laughs> well, it'll, I'll tell you something. It'll be all downhill from the way you started. I don't know what's, <laughs> I don't know what's left there, but I, I'm just going out on a limb. I don't think that you're going to have quite the luck that you did to start with. <laughs> I know. I haven't had that kind of luck since, really. Yeah. But, 
it, it's really been a neat neat journey um, being in metal detecting and and unfortunately I got out of it as uh, for several years as I grew older and trying to you know start a family and build a life and um, you know just in the last several years I say probably the last four or five years I've I've gotten into it um, and uh, just really have have just loved the hobby. Yeah. You know. We need to take a commercial break, but when we come back, we're going to talk to Rick about his favorite finds other than that first day and uh, what detectors that he's using now and what he's finding now. We are very excited to announce that Kelly Cole Metal Detectors is now the major sponsor of Relics Radio. Kelly Co. Metal Detectors has provided customers with the best metal detectors and accessories for over 60 years, and they offer the largest selection and best deals on metal detectors guaranteed. Kelly Co. Metal Detectors features only the very best of treasure hunting equipment that will help you find coins, rings, jewelry, and relics both on land and underwater. From gold pans to metal detectors, they carry the hottest selling products on the market. And Kelly Co. is just a phone call away, before, during, or after the purchase. You can call them at 855-246-2586 or visit the website at www.kellycodetectors.com. And by the way, guys, want to remind you that uh, sometime in September, toward the end of September, uh, in conjunction with Kelly Co., we're going to be giving away one of those Noctra Macro Simplex Plus metal detectors that uh, has the whole hobby a buzz. I can't wait for those to come out. And when we talked to uh, Delic Gagnule, uh recently she informed us that probably the second week of september is when those would start shipping out uh you can go on relics radio group page on facebook or you can go to digging with seven we've got some links to uh those detectors if you want to pre-order one but uh looking forward to that and looking looking forward to uh giving one of those away uh later in september Hey, Rick, uh, what are you swinging today? What kind of detector? Well, I'm using the Garrett AT Max now. Um, I I just really enjoy that. I've, I've got an AT Pro. and uh, But I just, there's something just about the AT Max having the wireless headphones and stuff. I just really enjoy using that detector. What's the biggest thing you've seen, it, the difference in between the uh, AT Max and the AT Pro? Well, you're, you're kind of putting me on the spot because they both have their advantages, you know. Um, I, I'm going to say the biggest thing to me is the wireless headphones because uh, I always get tangled up in the in the headphones on my Pro, but uh, which is easily solved by putting in wireless. But, um, you know, I guess really um, the tones, I, I kind of like the fact that I can just go into um, zero mode and, and just get in there and, and set my – discrimination up and my my um my sensitivity and, and just go i mean I, i'm not listening to a bunch of different tones there's you know three or four there's a couple grunts and high squeaks and you know i mean depending on on what you're hunting but i just i don't know i, I mean it's just to me it's, it's made life simpler yeah, um, and of course, I started hunting with a wireless headset uh, probably a couple of months ago. Of course, I hadn't been out but maybe twice with it, and, I mean, that was <laughs> – the wireless headset is unreal. I mean, I, I love it, so – but yeah, what, is, it's, what it's has been – yeah, what has been some of your uh, favorite finds that you found metal detecting, other than the uh, double barrel shotgun and the musket <laughs> and uh, – <laughs> well, and Quantrell's you know, gold go and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, let's go back to that, that same day. Um, that creek that runs through that property that I was telling you about, um, if you could imagine the field that I was hunting, the creek would run, actually would run north and south, or I'm sorry, uh, it was running east and west. And the property that I was hunting, the flat areas and where the roadbed was with the stagecoach and stuff was um, – running north and south well on the south side of that creek uh i decided to go across that creek and swing a little bit and i 
I pulled out a um, a jaw harp, or some people call them Jews harps, but uh, I pulled out a jaw harp, and it to this very day is my most favorite of all time find. And huh. people go, "Oh well, golly, why would why would a jaw harp be your favorite find?" Well, if you could, you know, if you were able to see what this creek looked like and the trees around it and the cottonwoods and the birch woods and stuff that it's just the most beautiful setting. And, and in my mind, I, I just pictured somebody either sitting on the, you know, the creek bank playing this jaw harp and all of a sudden bandits are coming after them and they dropped it running for their life or they were shooting at the bandits and dropped their rifle and took off running. And when they jumped the Creek, maybe it fell out of their pocket or their satchel or, or whatever. I mean, I just happened to, it just is my favorite find. And it's very, very gorgeous. It, you know, it was an 18, I looked it up, uh, and tried to date it the best I could. And I, it seemed to me like it was 1860s is when it was made. Cause it's the way it's forged. Um, it's it's almost like somebody took a piece of square stock and and made some really neat intricate designs on it. It's just a gorgeous piece. Um, I took it out to Las Vegas with me last year, two years ago, and showed it to Steve Moore from from Garrett. And of course, when I you know showed him, of course, all the people that were out there with Garrett, everybody was like show and tell. They they wanted to see it, but that's <laughs> that's probably my all time favorite find and i'm sitting here looking at it now it's hanging on the wall now Um, is it just the frame the uh reed part in the middle normally is gone on those yes sir the reed the reed is actually gone but you can see there's a flat spot where the reed was was um where the reed was hammered over a piece of the reed is actually in the heart yeah yeah where it was bracketed over but it um i don't even know how to describe it it's just a I'll have to send you a picture. I sent a picture to Mark Hoover, but it's just the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. I, I don't. Everybody's got their little quirks, and that's mine. <laughs> and <laughs> it was, I, I've never found one since. It was personal, you know. Uh, somebody had that, carried that, uh, played music with it, and uh, you know it. Uh, it was it was something special. Uh, Jeff found one of those uh, along the river here. You remember finding that, Jeff? <laughs> I do, I do, and um, that was my first one, and, and uh, I think I'd found a piece to one earlier, several years ago, but the one I found the hunting with you, I mean, it was in great shape. I mean, of course, it was missing the reed in the center, but, yeah. I mean. Well, yeah, it was I, it was yeah. real thin steel, and so that would be the first thing, you know, that would rust away on those. Uh, I, I remember my uncle uh uh, that lived over at uh, Glasgow, Kentucky. He used to play one of those all the time. Didn't have any teeth, and I tell you what, it was a sight. To, <laughs> it was a sight to see and something to hear. And he'd uh, he'd say, uh, "Listen to this song right here," and he'd give me the name of a song. You know, and then he'd say, "R, here's this one." And I told him, I said, "Richard, they all sound the same." <laughs> but uh, he he had a ball doing it, you know. Uh, yep. Hey, what about this, uh, upcoming, uh, digging in Georgia live event that's coming up in November in Warrington, Georgia. Tell us a little bit more about that before we go to another commercial break. Okay. Well, the, um, you know, I, when I got into metal detecting again, I, I was looking around for people to hunt with and, um, and then of course, Facebook starts popping up little things as I was searching and, and really, Jumped in that dig in Georgia live and started meeting a few people there. And um, Scott Hanson, the the guy that started that, which you've had him on the show, I think most of the listeners have have uh, heard that show. But um, he told me a couple years ago, he says, you know, I think I would like to have a, a seated hunt. And I thought, man, that would be great. And I said, let me know if I can help. And he reached out to me, sure enough. So long story short, he put together this hunt and I went out and started calling people and making contacts and, um, trying to get prizes for it. And it's, it's just turned in to be this really, I wish we had a bigger parcel of land because, you know, we'd probably have two or 300 people wanting to come out to this thing, but it, I think he capped it off at like 85 people. And it it just, it grew just seemed like in just a matter of weeks, it, it filled up and it's, 
uh, a first time hunt. We've got hundreds of prizes to give away. And, and Scott has really gone to great lengths to buy, uh, silver and bullets and just tons of different coins. And, um, we're giving away, I think we've got five metal detectors we're giving away. And, um, uh, we're going to do a canned food drive for uh, a homeless or a food bank, actually, um, there in the county that he lives in, in the town. And so if you bring in uh, five cans of uh, food, uh, you're going to get a ticket to hopefully you'll win a metal detector. So, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I've never been to an organized hunt, let alone tried to help organize one. And, um, it's just everybody in the metal detective community has really, really jumped on board to, to uh, make sure it's going to be a success. So I'm really excited about it. And uh, Mark Hoover's going to be there. And I think, Jeff, mm-hmm. are you going to be there? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Yep. Now, see, and hopefully seven, awesome. hopefully seven, he, he was talking about going down one day and we could do a live show. Now, I don't know yeah, that, if he's going to be able to go. That's kind of what we're yeah. thinking about, maybe going down on Friday. I would have to come back uh I would have to come back Saturday. Don't know that I would even stay for all of the hunt or anything, but come down on Friday and right. probably do a show on Friday night, and then uh, which would be pre-hunt, wouldn't it? Because the hunt is on. Is it on Saturday and Sunday, or what is the arrangement? It's just Saturday. Just Saturday. It's just Saturday. I, it's going to start. Uh, I think what we're going to do is is just because this is our first hunt, we didn't know what to expect or, or how it's going to run. And so we decided to go ahead and just do it like early Saturday morning. We're going to do registration and give everybody their packets or whatever and instruct them. And then um, probably about 930 or 10, I think we're going to start hunting and we'll have a lunch break. Um, One of the guys that I rodeo with a lot, he's a vendor and he's going to have uh, catered. He's, He's making the barbecue and so we're providing lunch for everybody, but he also makes great funnel cakes and fried pickles and you know, it's just you know there'll be some really good food there so uh, and then we're going to go back out and hunt for a little while and then we'll do the prizes maybe around three o'clock and we'll give away all the prizes and you know everybody can go on their way yeah but uh now is this you know, they, they, is it just a seated hunt or is uh this a historic area that might have some you know residual finds there that people could find Yes, sir. The landowner uh, is a detectorist, too, and he, he said that there was War of 1812 there. There was some Civil War activity. Um, there's colonial era stuff that they have found, and so you, you just never know what you're going to find. I mean, we're we're not just sitting in a parking lot throwing coins out. I mean, we're right. going out there and stabbing them in the ground, and so there's really weird. We don't know what's out there. I mean, he's not turning that property upside down, so um it, it, it's going to be a really exciting hunt because you don't know what you're going to find yeah rick do you know if uh what kind of detector the landowner uses i i don't i've never met him um i've i've been invited up to meet him but I, my rodeo schedule keeps me on the road quite a bit so uh, it's just not worked out so probably the first time i'll get to meet him will probably be on that friday uh night before the hunt yeah. Okay. I was thinking maybe the GPX would be a pretty good machine to take. So, of course, it's a, it's a deep machine. So, right, right. I, and and I don't know the lay of the land. I know the ground is is been uh, packed down. I mean, it's you know they they farm it, so it's been turned over. But then again, it's you know they use it as a parking lot during their uh, they they have uh, oh what do they they do receptions? It's a reception hall type thing. Old you know historic old barn and. A, historic old house in fact scott went out there uh to look the place over and uh his second or third signal was some old antique colonial era button so uh, i mean you never know the odds of, you, you're right and and that's what makes this uh, hobby so great uh is the fact that you just never know what you're going to pull out of the ground um at any given time well, that makes it uh, that makes it a little bit better. Makes it sound a little bit better that you've uh, got a seeded hunt and also uh, some natural finds there that can be found as well. Hey guys, let's take another commercial break and we'll be right back. You know, T-shirts are a perfect way to get your brand recognized. Whether you're talking about a business, a club, a sports team. 
your YouTube channel, or whatever. But you may have asked, where can I get quality, affordable shirts on demand? Well, I'm glad you asked. Relics Radio uses DetectTees.com for all of our T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, and hoodies. That's D-E-T-E-C-T-E-E-S.com. Ken and Mark Guthrie make quality shirts that last, they ship quick, and best of all, they're affordable. So if you need customized apparel, then go to DetectTees.com and be sure and tell them that Relics Radio sent you. And by the way, in our giveaway package tonight, Detect Tees is throwing in a Relics Radio cooling towel. You can also get uh, T-shirts there and falls right around the corner. And uh, I love those hoodies. Those were perfect uh, this last year. And uh, uh, Ohio Relic Hunter helped us out because now the shirts don't have that tattoo on the back where the <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky and Tennessee uh, is completely black. It's just an outline. And <laughs> Ohio Relic Hunter, I think, reached out to Ken and Mark and said, you got to change that. said, i got a permanent Kentucky, Tennessee tattoo on my back where the sun is hit and just burn it into my skin. <laughs> that was well, that is fault. a new tattoo. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, new tattoo we come out with. Yeah. But that's a good thing about uh, detectees. They will change anything that needs to be changed. And if you've got a club or you've got a sports team or whatever, you tell them what you want. And I tell you what, they will do it. They will do it at a price that will beat anybody's price and uh, good quality. I'm still wearing everything that I've got from them and can't wear the stuff out. I mean, it's great. Hey, Rick, I heard that uh, you're into air rifles. Tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, sir. I've, I've been... Uh you know, like every kid, you kind of grow up again, you know, hunting and fishing and doing the air gun thing. And, uh, we actually, when we moved to Georgia, um, I moved into a, an area, uh, bought a place that was just infested with coyotes. And even though I'm outside the city limits, I, I still had to take care of these, these animals because, uh, you know, my horses, I had horses and calves out here and chickens and, uh, my, pets of course but so anyways it was kind of a, a necessity that um I, I found something that you know didn't travel as far as a bullet you know a standard rim fire or, you know powder burner so uh, i got into the the pcp air rifles and um these things are they're just amazing i mean they've got the velocities of, of 22s and and some of them are what we call big bore you can hunt with them and uh, they're just, they're a lot of fun, you now, know. Now, you didn't say PVC, did you? <laughs> I said PCP. That is precharged pneumatic. Pre, uh, precharged know, pneumatic. I don't know yeah, that but, I've ever heard of those. Well, you know, it's, uh, air rifles have been around. Uh, a lot of people dispute it, but uh, most of your, your history stuff will say that the uh, PCP air rifle was invented in 1870. Or I'm sorry, uh, 15, I don't remember. Let me, uh, it wasn't 1870. It was, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking, 1780. PCP rifles were invented around 1780. And um, the Napoleonic, really, during the Napoleonic Wars between uh, uh, France and Austria, um, they were they were invented. The Austrian army actually carried an entire their platoons carried an in, you know they had tons of these guns. And uh, Napoleon was so scared of them that it, he, any of them were captured, were destroyed, and the people were shot and killed. I mean, it was a pretty scary situation to have an air rifle back then. <laughs> oh, I but, bet. Uh, but it's also a well-known fact that Lewis and Clark uh, carried one of these air rifles that was actually an Austrian Army surplus rifle. There's no record as to how uh, it got into the United States, but it's a well-known fact that they carried this uh, gun from one end of the country to the other and back again uh, I, without one loss of life. Yeah, I wondered what that was that he was carrying. 
<laughs> well, did you see Meriwether Lewis carrying that gun? Yeah, I saw. I saw him carrying it, and uh, you know, he he looked like somebody I didn't want to mess with. But I really, did, I really did wonder what it was. They're going crazy in the chat. They're saying uh, PBC is. Uh, Barb said it's some kind of pneumonia, and then somebody else said it's a it's a crazy drug. And, uh, uh, but it's also a, it's also an air rifle with a history. I can't believe seventeen eighty would uh you know during the uh N- napoleonic wars that that is old yes. i would have thought yes. if somebody had just come and asked me when air rifles were invented i would have probably what would you guess jeff I mean, uh probably the 20s yeah 1920s yeah me too 20s and or 30s rifles is, and everything that just blows me away now what kind how of how did they how did they get the charge in the how did they get the air in the there, yeah, that's a good okay, question. So, you didn't have to blow yeah, it up, did really you? Interesting. <laughs> you didn't blow it up <laughs> no, with your mouth, did you? No, you know, believe it or not, you know, when you think about it, this gun, this particular early model gun, held 800 psi, and the butt stock was actually the tank, and they used a pump that looks like kind of like a bicycle pump, and they would use, you know, they would use like leather um, seals, and they would pump this thing up to 800 psi. Um, just to put it in perspective, you know, a car tire is 32 psi. So uh, those early model guns were 21 shot repeaters, 46 caliber air rifles that would shoot a, a hole through a one inch pine board at 100 yards. Goodness wow. gracious. So, so you fast forward into the 21st century arena, and, and here we've got, you know, my air rifles hold 3,000 PSI of air, and I can shoot a 400-grain slug through a, you know, 4 by 4 <laughs> and uh, it, it just, um, you know, we, we deer hunt with them. Um, and typically, I don't shoot that big of a, a projectile, but it shoots a lead cast bullet, um, you know, kind of like a muzzle loader, if you, if you will. Um, but, um, you know, we've, we've killed, uh, deer and, and sheep out at 200 yards, uh, with these guns. And so, uh, I shoot a 45 caliber and I just, you know, it's a great, another great hobby or sport to be in. And I fell into it by accident. And the next thing you know, I'm doing TV and, uh, did a, did a stint with a show called American Air Gunner and, um, wound up being in a magazine and, traveling around with a company that that sponsored me and you know they called me one day out of the blue and said hey we'd like you to come to las vegas and talk about our air rifles and the rest is history so it's been a pretty exciting deal and you know, how been, many, you're going to give a many, signed copy of one of those magazines as far as part of this prize package tonight aren't you Yes, sir. That's the only way anybody would take one of them yeah. stupid things. Was <laughs> yeah. to it Go ahead, Jeff. I didn't mean to jump on that. Uh, Rick, how many PSI did you say the one you have shoots now or holds? 3,000 PSI of air. 3,000. So, yes, I've got a special air compressor. It, I have a three stage uh, compressor that takes, you know, to, to put that air into that tank. Um, I use a carbon fiber fill tank, so it's like a, you know, I know there's some firemen out there. The SCBA tanks are now that they use at the fire departments are carbon fiber, and they're 4,500 PSI for most firemen. Um, so uh, it takes a lot of lot of horsepower to actually air something up to 4,500 PSI, and it's a very slow process. When yeah, I, I was thinking, I man, you've got one huge bicycle pump. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was fixing to say, Jeff, I've always heard that uh, Rick Ward was long-winded. I didn't know that much. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, that only takes me half the time. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested to know what – and uh, by the way, uh, uh, Denny is on here, Ring Finder, and he said the Indians out west were scared to death of that air rifle. I, I'll get you to talk about that that in just a minute but also what kind of stock did that 1780 rifle have that would hold 800 pounds of pressure was it just wood? it was a hand, no sir it was a hand forged cast iron stock um and uh it actually screwed on to the where the butt stock would hook to a traditional rifle right there at the back of the receiver 
or the frame of the gun. It would kind of hook to that. Well, this actually screwed in to that gun. And the Austrian Army, um, I've actually held uh, Lewis and Clark's gun, uh, or the, the one they believed to be Meriwether Lewis's gun when I was at the NRA show uh, a couple years ago there in Nashville. Um, but it, it was a cast iron tank that um, would screw onto the back, and it also housed the seals to pump it up. So they would screw it onto this, this look, what looks like a bicycle pump rod, and they would actually push down on that buttstock and fill it up. When it got full, they would screw it back onto that gun, and, and they would go to town. Um, so the Austrian Army had a pack that would house two extra tanks. It would house the pump. It would house uh, speed loaders that would hold uh, 21 46 caliber shots. And then they had, the, they had the smelting pot where they could sit there at the campfire and, and, and mold their own uh, round ball ammo at that time Man, how heavy was this gun um the one it's really not that heavy i i'm thinking that it was i never did ask him how much it weighed but to me it felt like it might have been right around the five to seven maybe eight pound uh at the most okay, to me it's not really seem that heavy <clears throat> yeah but i'm you know i'm a big tall guy and i mean i'm six foot three so I mean, to me, it just didn't feel like it, you know, weighed a whole bunch, but you never know. I wonder why they didn't carry it on to the Civil War or later. I mean, I wonder why they well, didn't. You know, I mean, 20, what was it, 21 shots in, on one tank? 21 shot, 46 caliber, and they could they could empty that gun in just a matter of, of seconds. Um, there's a really great YouTube clip from the National Firearms Museum there on YouTube uh, that, that kind of goes over that. But, um, the, the thing about it is, uh, they, all these guns, you know, America didn't have that. Nobody knew about that in America. And, and there's no record of how Meriwether Lewis obtained that gun. And, and that's the only one at the time that they knew of to be in the country. Um, now, as far as I know, there are five Giradonis in the United States that are working, uh, which a couple of them were replicas, and then there's two originals that I know of. So, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know why it didn't, you know, people didn't know about it any more than than they did at that time. Other than, you know, uh, the ones that were captured were destroyed for the most part. So there's very few of them, and you know, around that are left. Um, yeah, I guess they were making so much money and uh, supplying. Uh, the Union or the uh, Confederates with rifles, they was like, no, we're not going to show them this error rifle. So, yeah, you know, probably so. But. Yeah, you say that, but that you're probably right. I mean, it uh, it was a uh, a monetary decision on on some people's part. You know, they uh, they wanted the they wanted to use the mini ball because uh, it had been invented, and I, you know. You know how politics is, especially with war and everything. So uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's who you are and it's who absolutely. you know. You know, one of the neat things about it, though, if you, if you think about it, something uh, Denny was talking about a while ago about the Indians being scared of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable that they could take, you know, Meriwether Lewis and uh, his, his party, Lewis and Clark, their party, there may have been what, maybe at any given time, maybe maximum 30 people. Yeah. And they went, the core of discovery went from one end to the other with not one loss of life due to any type of battle or fight. They lost, uh, you know, somebody died of gangrene and sickness or whatever it may have been, or maybe a, a bear attack or something, but there was not one fight between humans with firearms. Because if you read, uh, if you read Meriwether Lewis's journals, which, uh, I think Idaho, some, uh, the college in Idaho put it together or something, but there's hundreds of thousands of pages, but in, in the entry of the first couple entries are how they put on their best clothing and they, they went into town and, or into the village, and they introduced themselves to the Indians, and they showed them the air rifle. I mean, it's it's listed in his journal. And the Indians were amazed that this gun was so powerful, but yet so quiet and no smoke. No fire came out of the end of the barrel. You didn't have to charge it with, a, you know, with, with flash powder. Like back then would have been flintlock, not percussion cap. And right. so there was no, no 
big fire and smoke. So the Indians were terrified of it because they didn't know how many they had. Yeah. They didn't know how many people might be hiding in the woods that an entire village could be destroyed uh, in just a matter of, of minutes, and they would never you know, be able to tell the story about this strange magic rifle. <laughs> yeah. So I can imagine. It is a very interesting story. <laughs> yeah. That is very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, hey, guys, we need to take another commercial break. We'll be right back. If you want to keep up with what's going on in the metal detecting world, then you need to be a subscriber to American Digger magazine. Butch and Anita Holcomb are the publishers of the magazine and have won awards for three straight years for being the best digger magazine on the market. American Digger magazine is available in both print and digital formats, So no matter where you live in the world, you can enjoy the latest happenings in the hobby. You can get in touch with American Digger magazine by going to AmericanDigger.com or give them a call at 770-362-8671. And be sure and tell them that you heard it on Relics Radio. And as most of you know, I am now the producer and a co-host on American Diggers Relic Roundup with Butch Holcomb and Jeff Lubert. We're on every Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. And uh, pick up that magazine. It is, without a doubt, the premier digging magazine in the world right now. You can get the uh, print version of that or you can get the online version. Just go to AmericanDigger.com. And tell them that digging was seven cents you whenever you go over there in Tennessee, Jeff. Uh, we don't get anything out of it but a pat on the back by Butch. But uh, that that's worth something, ain't it, Jeff? Yeah, we didn't even get a pizza. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said he was going to lay, lay the anchovies down there on a plate for us when we got there. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, No, Butch is a great guy, Butch and Anita. I love him to death and uh, can't wait to meet him again. Uh, it'll be up in the... Uh, uh, upstate new york when i see them again so yeah can't wait yeah they're gonna be uh you know, pound the ground there can i say something about butch and anita real quick sure you know they had the green room back there for the vendors uh at the chattanooga show yeah and um i i was so tired because you know i was trying to pack up and get ready for a big rodeo that following week and had just been on the road a bunch the entire week but um, I, I drink the heck out of coffee. I love coffee and drink way too much, but I was so tired. I went and asked Anita, I said, Miss Anita, I said, I know that the green room is for your vendors. I said, but could I talk you out a cup of that coffee? Because they weren't selling coffee there. And she goes, are you that tired? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And I explained to her, but they were so kind to let me go in there and, and drink. I drank two or three cups of coffee while I was in there. But they're just wonderful people. I mean, behind the scenes, you know, I mean, I know they had a job to do, but uh, they're just just great people. I mean, it was really a pleasure to finally get to meet them. I've, I've spoke with them on the phone uh, in the past, but they're just yeah. just great people. Well, we had, uh, me and Jeff had both met Butch and Anita because, uh, well, at the Chattanooga show last year and uh, the South Carolina show in January, which that'll be coming up again in uh, this coming January. But uh, that was the first time that the Relic Roundup crew, me and Butch and Jeff, uh, had all got together. And uh, first time that I'd ever met Jeff Lubert, and uh, he, he's a great guy too. So it was. Uh, that's what I love about, you know, these uh, Relic shows and gatherings and hunts and things like that it's it's uh just getting to meet the people and uh you know that's the greatest find that we're ever going to get out of this hobby is the people that we meet along the way and i know really and i got to meet you and uh just so many other people uh at this last one uh at chattanooga that uh and I'll never be the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I got to meet Jeff and, and, and you guys, of course, Jeff Lubert. And, um, you know, Heath Jones and I have talked on the phone over a course of over a year, you know, back and forth. So I finally got to meet him. He actually let me go hunting at his place. He was out of town. 
and I was actually working a rodeo in his hometown. And I called him and asked him, you know, is there any parks or anything? And he says, nothing you want to hunt. And he said, uh, you can go out to my family farm and hunt. And I mean, opened it up. I mean, I just to a total stranger, but, um, of course, uh, Greg Pickens with finding America and, you know, met him. And so it was fun. It was fun to finally get to, you know, put the handshake on there, so to speak, to, to people who I've chatted with on the phone and, and in chat rooms and, and things like that. I I would recommend that show to anybody. If you've never been to a relic show, if you do nothing but go there and just stand at the door and, and look for the personalities that you know or, or see and, and shake their hands. Um, in fact, um, I saw him in here earlier. Um, uh, Jason Smith, the detecting Smith, him and his wife yep. came there and they, mm-hmm. they walked up to me and they, they introduced themselves and I was, I was shocked, you know, and yeah. cause I just started watching their videos, but just great, great people. And he and I have had several phone conversations, you know, and it's just a great, great hobby. I know that every, every sport and hobby has a bad apple or two, but don't let that uh, sway anybody from, from getting into this hobby because it, um, you know, it's, it's just something that, you know, meeting these people, people and being able to start lifelong relationships with um you know if i never went out metal detecting again in my life i've made a dozen friends in this hobby that i guarantee you uh will be friends until i'm gone from this earth yeah so well well said well said yeah it is how did you get into rodeo work and what do you do Uh, at the rodeos (laughs) i don't think you've even talked about that you're not a clown, well, are you? <laughs> no, <a> clown. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I'm not a clown, and I don't ride bulls. No, so, well, uh, well it, you it got a little sense. That, yeah, very little. <laughs> um, you know, my dad was a my dad was a bareback bronc rider way back in the '60s, and um, you know, I rode bareback horses and uh, competed in rodeo for for many years, and. Um, probably about the third year of, of being married. I got married in 1990. Um, and my wife was still in college at the time. And, uh, I was rodeoing as hard as I could and, uh, thinking I was going to make a living at, at rodeo. And, uh, so anyways, I, I got hurt and just, she, you know, upon that same time in 1993, she says, Oh, by the way, we're going to have a baby. And, um, uh, you know, I just felt like I needed a real job and, it wasn't until I moved to Georgia 25 years ago, I was actually playing guitar and singing at a, a pre-rodeo dance. And um, they needed a sound guy, and they said, hey, can you move all your sound equipment over to the rodeo arena? I said, sure. And so I started just playing some cassette tapes and things. And, you know, anyway, long story short, <laughs> Uh, somebody had heard me talking on the microphone and said, you know, you really ought to be a rodeo announcer. And I said, you know, my wife and family have told me that for years. And, uh, next thing you know, I, I announced a bull riding for a guy and some little junior rodeos. And, um, I actually got my professional rodeo card, um, in 2005, um, with the PRCA, which is a professional rodeo cow, cowboy association. That's, um, the kind of the measuring stick of all professional rodeo and um so yeah i mean i've been announcing rodeos for several years but i went pro in 2005 but i've been um named announcer of the year in a couple different associations and you know just have been announcing rodeos all over the country and and uh, just in the last five years have really slowed down and just keep it within uh say georgia florida alabama um, uh, a little bit in Tennessee. I try not to travel too far anymore because I do have a full-time job, but rodeo has, has opened up a lot of doors for us. And, um, it's allowed my kids to see more of the country than most people will ever see in a lifetime. I can, I can assure you that. Well, I had a good friend of mine I worked with for years, uh, his name's Steve Todd and everybody called him rodeo. And of course he, he made a living out of it for a while. And then, uh, of course, he was riding a bull one night, and uh, he got hung up, and then the bull ended up stomping him real bad and hurting him. And luckily, uh, I mean, he made it through it, but uh, after that, he said his uh, rodeo career was over. So, 
But we've got a you, question. You know, it's a, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to. Uh, we got a. Uh, uh, we got a question from Bill Marsh. Has any of your uh, rodeo announcement jobs uh, landed you any leads to uh, metal detecting permissions? <laughs> it's funny you say that because I carry a metal detector with me on the road all the time because, uh, yes, it has. It, it has um, opened up leads for that, um, and, and sometimes I, I go to some of these old historic old towns and I can – I can get parks or, you know, there'll be somebody on the rodeo committee that says, you know, my great granddaddy used to camp out here with a, you know, Pancho Villa or something, you know, I mean, it just, it, it opened, it opens up a lot of doors. And, and when I don't have permissions, uh, typically I'll sit around the rodeo arena and I'll, you know, walk around the, the fairgrounds or wherever it may be. Cause some of those places are, they date way back. Um, I've never found anything really super cool, but, uh, you know, some old coins, uh, you know, necklaces and rings and things like that, which, you know, I'm not, not scoffing at. I, I love finding that stuff. You know, anything you find out of the ground's fun. They bound to be all kind of stuff falling out of the pocket to them bull riders, too. <laughs> the way they, the way well, they're bouncing. <laughs> You know, the, the funny thing is my son who rode bareback horses when, when he was alive, he, uh, he used to tell me all the time, he'd go, dad, 30 feet out from the buck and shoot, 30 feet out from the buck and shoot. <laughs> and I never did, I never thought about it, but he's right because, you know, most of the bulls and the horses, they buck, you know, just 30 feet outside of that, that buck and shoot. And those guys will wear necklaces and some of them wear rings and carry coins for good luck and just. And you you don't see it on the ground because it's dark, it's at night, and, you know, uh, so after the rodeo's over, I, you know, I'm so wound up on adrenaline from announcing. I mean, it's like doing a, a rock concert for two hours and ten minutes. Uh, it's just you give them everything you've got as a rodeo announcer um, because you're talking, I mean, you're in charge of keeping that crew. Uh, the, the you know, I mean, there might be five, ten thousand fans out there, and, and if you just kind of go in there kind of humdrum and, Oh, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, he got bucked. Out. I mean, it just, they go to sleep on you. So, yeah. Uh, so anyways, you know, the adrenaline rush that I have, it takes me forever to shut down after the rodeo. So, um, after the stock's fed and everybody's gone, the lights are out, I'd go out there with a headlamp and just start, you know, walking in and out of the arena and around there and finding stuff. And I try to return it. If I know who it was that lost it and, Typically, somebody will come to the announcer stand and say, oh, man, I lost a necklace that means a lot. And so I go out and try to find it for them. That's greater joy there than, you know, finding anything else if I can return something to somebody. Yeah, yeah, it is. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And I know what you're talking about. I used to play music uh, on the road, and, you know, you get all wound up in a show, and it'd take you half the night, you know, to wind down because of all the adrenaline and everything. And uh, and. I'm sure that that is the same with you. It takes me a little while to wind down after we do one of these shows. How about you, Jeff? <laughs> it does. It really does. And, and I couldn't imagine, especially being on the back of a uh, uh, horse or a uh, bull doing a, in a rodeo. I mean, it would take you a while to settle down after that. Well, I was raised out yeah. in, in Lubbock, Texas, out in West Texas, and all those little towns there every weekend – had a rodeo and you know they didn't have all the safety uh, guidelines and everything back then and somebody got hurt bad every weekend around there and so i figured out real quick that uh i wasn't going to be no rodeo person you know uh i'd do something else i'd, I'd play music at one of them or something other but you ain't gonna catch me on the back of no bull that's right i tell people you couldn't melt me down and pour me on the back of a bull i just I traveled with two bull riders for about seven years, and uh, we never got to the rodeos on time. They were always chasing girls. The first girl that smile at them, they'd make a U-turn on the interstate, and <laughs> we'd wind up in some town somewhere. And you know, I mean, it was just, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a million dollars for those memories, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't give you a nickel to relive them. Well, you know? <laughs> I know what you know. I'm going to tell you something there. It's a whole different world. Life on the road is, and the people that you have to be on the road with so many stories that, uh, that could be told, you know, about, uh, we had a drummer one time. I don't know if I ever told this or not. And, uh, Freddie Davidson, he was out of California 
and uh i noticed one night on the drum stool he was kind of sitting crooked you know and so after the show i said what's the matter were you you hurting in the back or something oh he said no it's i got hemorrhoids he said killing me you know and i said well they make something for that i said when we get on the bus you know tomorrow we'll pass through a town i said just tell the driver to stop so we did and uh, it was a night or two later at a show he's still leaning up on that stool i said did did you not take that preparation h he said i tell you what i just have to live with these hemorrhoids i said why he said that's awfulest tasting stuff i ever put in my mouth and i said you didn't eat it did you he bought the suppositories he said i read on the package it said insert and let mount said i just put one under my tongue but he didn't say too much that <laughs> night <laughs> that <is terrible. laughs> it, it is oh, it, no. it, it is terrible one morning we stopped at a at a restaurant to get breakfast and of course everybody's about half the sleep you've drove three or four hundred miles overnight to get to the next town and waitress come around and uh he she said what will you have he said eggs and he said or she said to him said how do you like your eggs and he said i like them said i mean how do you like them cooked he said i like them even better that way so it was a it was something (laughs) uh, all all the time hey guys we're going to open up the phone lines right now and we're going to have a contest too phone lines are two seven zero four nine five zero three one five here are the two questions don't call in we'll we'll take our general calls in a moment don't call in right now unless you can answer these two questions what does pcp stand for in regard to this rifle that we talked about and what year was it invented what does pcp we need three words the pc uh, p rifle what do those three letters stand for and what year was it invented and you can call in right now at 270-495-0315 we've got a uh, a cohen book from uh, kelly co successful cohen honey uh by garrett that we're going to give away we've got a relics radio cooling town we got one of those <laughs> we got one of those magazines that rick ward can't give away but we're going to give one away tonight <laughs> <laughs> so if you were listening earlier in the show well uh give us a call phone lines are open 270-495-0315 hey rick I'm, I'm sorry go ahead ohio relic Hunter. i was just i just happened to look at the chat screen and ohio a relic hunter said, I bet that guy was humming a lot. The one that ate the suppository. He wasn't a singer. He, he, was, he was just the drummer. So it didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't hurt the show. The show went on. <laughs> oh, me. I probably shouldn't have told that. Uh, I don't even know if he's still That's alive. So, so many of those guys, you know, died early deaths, uh, uh, because of the lifestyle that, uh, that, musicians on the road live and everything you know but uh that- you know it's it's funny you say that because that uh you're absolutely right i mean a lot of people aren't cut out to handle that lifestyle and um it's it's a very fine line that you have to walk and um fortunately i um i had a family um at the i guess you could say at the height of my music career and my rodeo career i mean we had you know, we had a family, so I was, you know, I was focused on, on making a living and, and, you know, being the best I could be, you know, even today. So, you know, the, the carousing and going out and carrying on and, um, you know, just real quick story about rodeo, the biggest, uh, ovation that I ever got, I got a standing ovation. I was working with a rodeo clown that was less than, you know, what I like, but, um, he said, hey, you going to go out and get drunk tonight with everybody? And I said, no, sir. He says, why not? And I said, because. I said, I'm going to go back to the trailer. I'm going to dish out some ice cream and read my kids a bedtime story. And, I mean, there was 15,000 people stood up and cheered. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, and I, I, I was just shocked. I mean, because, you know, again, I'll say it all. I say it all the time. This country lacks family values, and you know yeah. we won't get onto that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that, and I'm I'm right story. with you on that. We've got a call, Greg Pickens from Finding America. Greg, you got the answer to those questions? <laughs> uh, I think so. Okay, give uh, it a shot. Was a precharged pneumatic, and I think the year was 1780. Oh, perfect! Congratulations, perfect! That's you, right. You are the winner. Uh, you are the winner right there. 
Did, yeah. did you well, know that before the show? No, but when okay, Rick talks, right. I listen. All right. Well, you, well you, somebody has learned something. Well, I mean, I know I've learned something, but we can say somebody else has learned something now. So. Yep. Oh, yep. Greg. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Greg, you get with, uh, and I've added Barb on. We'll get to you in just a second here, Barb. Uh, Greg, you get with Mark Hoover and give him your address and everything. And uh, we will be sure and get that out to you. And uh, appreciate the call. We'll uh, we need, right. okay. We need to move on over to Barb. What's going on tonight, Barb? Hello, Barb. I, dis- I disagree. I believe it was invented in 1779. <laughs> 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 oh me. Well, uh, I said people are disputing it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it, we have to go with uh, we have to go with what our guest said, and uh, you know, to to make it fair, you may be right. I can't remember the year. I mean, I was just a youngster back then, and you know, it's hard for me to remember. <laughs> I remember what it looked like, but I can't remember the uh, can't remember the year. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a giveaway. Do what? I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I said you're doing a giveaway and you don't know the answer. Oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. Well, no, we uh, we knew what answer we wanted, <laughs> whether whether it's uh, <laughs> seventeen seventy or seventeen ninety nine or seventeen eighty or seventeen seventy nine or or whatever. We knew the answer. That we just said it was a trivia question from uh, you know from our guests. But uh, anyway, Greg I've, Greg I've Pickens been picking one. On you. Good show tonight. Okay, thanks, Barb. Thanks for the call. Thank you, Barb. And, Thanks for calling uh, in, Barb. And guys, we uh, we uh, we're going to open up the lines to just any general calls now, since we've got a winner. If you want to call in, if you've got a question for Rick, uh, we would appreciate uh, you calling in and and asking a question, and uh, we will we'll deal with that the best that we can. Uh, but phone Mark's lines are open. Two seven zero. Four nine five zero three one five. Let me say it one more time. By myself, two seven zero four nine five zero three one five. Now go, Jeff. Okay, Mark Sloan said he was going to set that one out uh, right before Greg won. He's uh, he's going to set that one out. So <laughs> he didn't win again. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Mark Sloan won two of uh, the note to micro uh, giveaways he won the amphibio and he won the pulse dive and uh, he came up and hunted with me on uh, saturday of this last week and i gave him that pulse dive and i told him i said now delic gonyale said you cannot be in the contest on the simplex <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah uh denny morrison <laughs> is on the line here what's going on tonight denny I'm just sitting here. I got a question for uh, eh, Rick. Rick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When or uh, where did they Lewis and Clark purchase the rifle? There, they there's took? no. Well, to to my knowledge, and in, in what I've researched and the way I understood it, there was not really any record as to how he acquired that rifle. Um, and this is coming from his journals. There was never any information written in the journals that and then there's thousands of pages in those journals uh as to how he acquired it because it, it would have had to come from from austria well so, that's true but uh I'm, I'm just looking at google now and they say that uh, while equipping the expedition lewis purchased one at the government arsenal in harper's ferry virginia or harper's ferry west virginia right or well it would have been virginia See, I, then Yep. Yeah. He learns something uh, new every day because I've never, I've never heard that. Um, and then, and of course this is coming, you know, the, the knowledge and the, the, the stuff that I have acquired as far as the knowledge of this gun, it, it all came from, you know, the historians, one of the guys who actually owns the gun. And, uh, then a couple of historians that are actually taking care of the gun at the national firearms museum. And, uh, right. real quick, Dennis Gretchen Cord put in there that, uh, 1500s according to wikipedia 
Now, that is air rifles in general, not the PCP. Um, That's right. The way, you know, that, uh, that Giradoni is so far advanced uh, in comparison to what, uh, because it was a multi-shot repeater. So uh, that really is when they said it. And that's like when, when we first started talking about them, I said there's a lot of controversy as to when the first PCP or, you know, when air rifles were invented. Uh, so that PCP was like the Cadillac of, of any gun ever made uh, in 1870. So there you go. <laughs> Rick, if you ever get out to Great Falls, Montana, there's a great national park right on Great Falls uh, about uh-huh. Lewis and Clark. And uh, I was, in fact, I was there this spring when I went to uh, visit uh, John Hawkins, who's uh, a great, great friend. You talk about friends. I met John at uh, Digging in Virginia many years ago, and this year I took the Amtrak train out and stayed with him for about a week. And uh, there's just another friend that that I've gained through metal detecting, plus Loy and everybody else on the chat. Pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, you know. I- I was listening to one of your calls here on one of the shows when you were talking about being stationed over here in Georgia. And, uh, when you'd said it, I said, well, by golly, I know exactly where, you know, he's talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always enjoy hearing you and, and I appreciate you calling in. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the call, Denny. We've got, uh, we've got another call in, uh, 5458. Who have we got? This is Jason Smith. Hey, Jason. What's going hey, on? Today? Jason. Appreciate you calling in. Well, I, when I saw who I was having on tonight, so I guess I got super excited because, uh, I mean, Rick's a really great guy. Oh, I agree. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I got a question, and uh, I think I already know the answer to the question, but, uh, Rick, uh, what is your favorite kind of hunting with, in detecting? Well, you know, it's that's kind of a loaded question because anything that, that, that you find, whether it be a soda pop tab, a shotgun shell, or, you know, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it was lost and, and I found it. Um, but I guess because we don't have a lot of civil war history where I'm at, um, you know, I, I like hunting around old homesteads and, and things like that. So I guess, um, you know, any, anything old, uh, Jason, I mean, really, uh, yeah, because I found some really neat history around some of these old houses. Um, you know, I found one guy that worked for the railroad. I found his, his Porter's badge. I found a railroad key. Actually, Bo Amet found the railroad key, but I found the cufflinks and found his, uh, several buttons, uh, from his, from his, uh, uh, train uniform. So, you know, I, I really, really like hunting around old, old houses. Yeah. Does I that like help? <laughs> yes, that answers my question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll hunt anything. So don't uh you know, if if you call me to go over there with y'all one, one weekend or if I'm over that way heading to Texas, uh I will hunt the city park, I will hunt the trash can. I it it doesn't matter. I mean somebody's gonna <laughs> drop something. <laughs> I got a bunch of permissions whenever you get ready. Hey, so I hear you, brother. Sounds good. All right, thank, thank you. All for your time. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll thank you. Go. Thank you for the call. Yeah, thanks for the call all there, right, Jason. Thank you, Jason. And uh, thank you guys for being part of the show, listening uh, to the show. Uh, phone lines are still open, 270-495-0315. And Jeff is Johnny on the spot. He done stuck it in there again. Uh, we'll just take yeah. a general call if you've got a question for uh, Rick or us. Uh, call in. Hey, Rick, I couldn't, I couldn't help but uh, pick up on, and you and I have not talked about it at all, uh, but you said that your son passed away. Is that something that, uh, that you would yeah. discuss? <clears throat> sure, sure. Uh, Matthew uh, was, was our oldest son, and he was a rodeo cowboy. He rode bucking horses. Uh, he was a real cowboy. He worked on a ranch. I mean, that's how he made his living, working cattle and um so uh back in uh, in uh March of twenty eighteen he was on his way, he called his mom on Friday and said, Hey, I've had a long day, I'm gonna spend the night and then they were he was gonna come down here, uh hang out with us and then there was a town 
about an hour south of us. Matter of fact, it's the town uh, where Craig Atwater and uh, his family live. And big shout out to Craig and Junior, by the way, real quick, because he told me hi in the chat. So, uh, so anyway, Matthew was uh, coming down, uh, and he told his mom uh, Friday. He said, uh, "Hey, I'll you know I'll be there around noon." And uh, on Saturday, and, and we'll hang out, and then we'll go to the rodeo. And uh, I guess about 1230, we got a phone call that, that no parent ever wants to get. And uh, his car, you know, middle of the day, you know, just left the road, and uh, he was killed instantly uh, in that terrible car crash, you know. But um, we lost him, and it's, um, you know, it's one of those things. And there might be people out here listening that, uh, you know, you can't compare – losing anybody i mean anytime you lose anybody uh it's it's devastating right uh, whether it be your wife your grandmother you know and jeff he's going through that i mean it's uh there's no and i just want people to understand and know that there is nothing written in stone that says uh you grieve for xyz and then it's all gone it's it's never gone and um this hobby the, the people that are in this hobby will reach out to you and wrap their arms around you um, with, in whatever you're going through. And, right. and a bunch of have been, you know, I mean, that's what really, you know, just blew me away about this, this hobby was the, the amount of people that reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I don't know how you feel, but I know what you're going through because I went through it with this and I went through it with that. And, um, you know, so it's, uh, uh, I would encourage people don't, don't give up the fight. If you're, you know, if you've lost somebody and you're grieving and, uh, in fact, if you look up the history of grieving, uh, when the men would wear black coats, I mean, that's where that came from. And the women would wear black and, and wear a veil, um, when they'd go out in public and that signified they're, they're grieving, they, yeah. they're grieving a loved one. Yeah. Um, so you know, I just want to encourage people to, you know, to reach out for, for anything. I mean, your local church, there's there's great groups out there, the grief share groups that um, I didn't think that, you know, I thought, well, these people don't know what I'm going through. and But I went to one, and, and lo and behold, I just, I sat and listened. Yeah. And so I read the literature. And, but, yeah, it's been a very, very tough thing. And, in fact, I've just really gotten my feet back under me and started uh, – getting back into filming on the air gun side of things. And, um, I've got a YouTube channel called urban air gunner. And, um, uh, you know, I go out and I do stupid videos, but you know, this year, you know, we're going to do a lot of hunting and, and so it'll be kind of like a miniature, you know, maybe a miniature TV clip or something like that of different people that I, I hunt with around the country. And, uh, so yeah, you know, um, we, we lost our oldest, well, and the reason that I ventured in that area and everything is because we've had people on before that uh, have had tragedies like that. And, uh, you know, with without exception, everybody says that metal detecting and being in the metal detecting community is therapeutic whenever you're going through a crisis like that. And you're exactly right. This hobby has a lot of big hearts and a lot of people that will reach out, put their arms around you. Uh, it doesn't make the pain go away, but they can help you get through another day. And uh, so uh, I agree with you. You know, uh, whatever you're going through, reach out to this community because, uh, you know, everybody loves you and everybody is uh, is really willing to help. And we got another call. Tim Henderson is calling. What's going on tonight, Tim? Hey, Lloyd. How y'all doing tonight? We're doing how are good, you doing, buddy. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Tim, yeah. How are you? Yeah, we can oh, hear you. Hello, Rick. It's been good listening to the stories tonight. Well, thank you very much, actually, Tim. I appreciate that. I'm actually sitting here finishing up a order on a coin ring. Uh, for some folks that we know, but I can't say anything about it right now. Um, <laughs> Rick, I'd like to, uh, I'm just hearing you talk about your son. It just kind of heavy on my heart there. Um, I'd like to make you a coin ring, um, in remembrance of your son. Oh, and wow. Can, 
Can I make maybe a, we can get together? Can I make a suggestion? Yeah, make a suggestion on. Can I make a suggestion uh-huh. on that? Why don't uh, Rick? Why don't you give Tim Matthew's birth year and let him make you a ring of his birth year? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I mean, that would be. Um, well, you just that'd be. Yeah, pretty, you just get. You just get, you know, get with Tim, uh, message him, okay. and and tell him and. I think that that would be a great memorial and uh, and everything and and what a gesture. That's what I'm talking about, people, right there. That, you know? that's, that's yeah, exactly that's right. awesome. I'm I'm kind of speechless. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start crying or nothing. That is a that's a very awesome gesture, and I can you know cannot thank you enough for for doing that. I mean, it's yeah. that's just awesome. Man, that's just what's on my heart right now, brother, and that's just what's on thank my you. heart and. Uh, I'm going to look, too, and see if maybe I can find a silver round or something that maybe is rodeo-related. That, um, that you know, would be awesome. Thinking about that, too. Yeah. But, Lloyd, give him yeah. my information and, and, and let him reach out to me, and we can discuss it some more. I will. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll send it to him, or Mark Hoover will send it to him, and we'll get you hooked up. And uh, I guess I'll see you in a few days, won't I, Tim? Yeah, I hope so. I'm picking up tanks. Hopefully Monday or Tuesday, and I'm, we need to get together before it gets too cold. So, well, uh, we need those tanks Tuesday. That's when we were talking about going to uh, that spot that I talked about. If you, okay, if and maybe you, we can make that happen. Yeah. Um. Hopefully, hopefully, if they'll get done soon enough, he said it would be Monday. Okay. Um, Okay. So hopefully the holidays doesn't slow that down or anything, but we'll, I'll talk to you about that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't want to get off chasing rabbits or anything. Hey, Tim, thank you for calling, <laughs> and uh, thank you for Tim, thank you. Thank you for yeah, the, thank for you the very gesture, much, Tim. and uh, we'll we'll hook you up with Rick, and uh, and uh, y'all get that done. Thanks a lot. That's my, awesome. Thank my you. pleasure. My pleasure. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, guys, right there. It just happened uh, before our, I started to say before our eyes, but before our ears. We see uh, somebody in the community uh, reaching out yeah. to somebody else in the community. And, uh, you know, you pay it forward. We've all had those moments of tragedy. And uh, Greg Pickens is calling back in. He's going to give you back that. He's going to give you back that autograph magazine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Greg. Oh, boy. Uh, what did you forget there a while ago? Oh, I, I wanted to ask Rick something as much as we've talked on the phone all the time. I've never asked him, and you ask this of, of your guests sometimes, but I wanted to know any place in the world, where would Rick want to go metal detecting? Hey, great question. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um. You know, I really never give it a lot of thought other than, you know, I mean, probably somewhere further out west, like an old boom town. I mean, I'm a, I'm a U.S. kind of guy. I believe in um, people talk about, you know, going on these lavish vacations around the world. But, you know, there's so much history in our own backyard that people take for granted. So, And you're um, a cowboy, I'm, too. You want to get that old west yeah, history. You know, I really – well, I was thinking, I was actually thinking maybe, you know, Montana or Wyoming, um, yeah. you know, just, just an old boom town or something like that. Um, actually probably somewhere up around your neck of the woods around Knoxville. You <laughs> 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 finding all kinds of cool stuff. I, I watch your videos and I'm just, you know, I'm smiling for you and I'm happy, but I'm also saying, you sorry, rascal. You <laughs> have it. the best luck. Hey, let's all get but, in the car. Uh, let's all get in the car tomorrow and drive up to Greg's place because I'm not that far. Uh, Jeff is not that far, and you're not that far. We can all just converge on Greg up there. But yeah, I, there I guess I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to share my new spots with you. I don't know. <laughs> 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 there you go, man. Well, well I guess. Well, um, well, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and write you another check since you called in twice. <laughs> So you get a bonus. Oh, good. So I appreciate you calling. <laughs> well, that's, that's good, man. I thought you was going to give. The, I thought you was going to give the autograph book back. Reminded me of a uh, a guy going down the road, and uh, a trooper got in behind him with a lights on, and the guy didn't stop, and he he ran him for about thirty miles, and finally got him to stop. You know, and he said, "Fella, 
what are you doing? Did you not see that I had the lights on trying to stop you? And he said, yeah. He said, but my wife ran off with a trooper about a year ago, and I was afraid it was you, and you were bringing her back. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Uh, Hey, thanks for the call, Greg, and congratulations on winning the prize package. Uh, We'll get that to you. And good luck on your hunts, too. Okay. I may have cut him off in mid sentence. Didn't mean yeah. to do that, but uh, he'll call me. He'll call you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll like call you. Me. Hey, I've got your <laughs> Facebook page uh, mentioned, but I don't have any of your other contacts. And before we get off here tonight, and we're about five minutes out, really. Uh, so okay. go ahead and give out all of your information, if you will. Uh, YouTube channels, <laughs> Facebook, anything that you've got, let them know. Yeah, um, well, I have my relic hunting uh, channel, which is really uh, suffering from subscribers, and the content really is terrible, so I, I know why. But it's Relic Hunting with Rick um, on YouTube, and then I have the Urban Air Gunner, which is um, my other air gun channel. I, I didn't want to mix the two. And then you can find me on Instagram uh, at Urban Air Gunner. So there you go. And then Rick Ward on Facebook. So, yeah, you got almost as many yeah. channels as I've got. I can't keep up with them. I ain't done anything in the last week, though. I kind of took a break away from everything for about a week. But, uh, yeah, guys, go and check him out. And uh, I tell you, Rick, you've been a, an absolute fabulous guest, hadn't he, uh, Jeff? Did we, Did lose? we lose Jeff? I don't know if we lost <laughs> Jeff or not. Did you meet him? He, he might have muted himself. He I'm here. Okay. No. <laughs> oh, scared, oh, boy. scared us there for a little bit. I said we, he was a wonderful guest, wasn't he? Oh, he sure was. Yeah, he was a great guest. And uh, hopefully have him again. And then, uh, of course, he's not far away, so he should come up here and hunt sometime. And he'll be in Nashville. When was it, uh, Rick? Uh, it'll be next spring uh, for the NRA show that's going to be there in downtown Nashville. So. Um, I'll definitely let you know when I'm going to be close and, um, you know, yeah, I'd love to go hunting with you. Okay. I'll shoot, I'll shoot you, uh, my phone number, uh, on, uh, Facebook and then, uh, you can contact me when you're up this way. Anytime you want to come up here, just, uh, head up this way. Yeah, absolutely. Let, well, I, yeah, let I us know. Say, I want to go to five mile holler. <laughs> well that would be a good time uh early in the spring uh i took mark and i took mark sloan too but we can't hunt the good spot that is there because uh, it's a hay field and it's uh it's over waist high so we couldn't get back in there yeah but, and they're full of copperheads it's full of copperheads me and mark hoover killed yeah. one in there uh, or the Lord called the poor thing home after the 38 uh, had an encounter with it. I don't know which. But anyway. Well, I won't tell you about the alligator that, that came up behind me then. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, we'll say. I was hunting the, edge of, Go ahead. hunting the edge of a pond and the gator came up, uh, you know, and I I had to scare him off. So mm-hmm. uh, I by screaming and running the opposite direction so. <laughs> i guess that works yeah it did i didn't see him <laughs> yeah uh i tell you what we've got one more call come in let's take it real quick 5296 sure. uh have we got you on uh, this yeah this is craig okay craig i, hey. I, I just hey. hey i just had to call in and, and uh and and ask Mr. Rick if he's found any any heel plate in the past. <laughs> well, I haven't I haven't found any more recently, as you know, because you're usually the first guy that I call. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell that story here in just a second before we have to go. Um, but uh, well, I I can tell it real quick, can I, Lois? You got about a minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, Craig's watching one of my videos, and he calls me and goes. And he sends a, a message on, on YouTube at the certain time that he saw this bent up piece of metal. He goes, please tell me that you still have that piece of metal. And I said, what? He goes, that, that heel plate. And I said, that was not a heel plate. That's wadded up. I said, you're talking about the toe tie. <laughs> and he goes, no, sir. And so I looked. I'm on the phone with him. I'm nervous now. I'm like, I just lost <laughs> something that I've never found before. 
And lo and behold, it was, I did keep it. It was in a bucket of unidentified objects that I keep. And he says, Mr. Rick, that is a heel plate. So I went and started searching about heel plates and come to find out they're not all made the same. They all had different designs on them. This one had a clover leaf in it. Really? And, uh, yeah, Craig saved me. So I've, I've got the heel plate <laughs> and the in a, in a box and, and in this place. And, and you and you looked for it for about 45 minutes while I was on the phone with you until you finally found it. Yeah, I was, he had me almost in tears. I mean, I was dumping yeah, he, buckets out in the garage. So, but yeah, and, and yeah. Craig is one of those guys that, that we, we get, you know, we're only about an hour away and, um, Craig and, and Junior just stand up people. And, um, I've said it behind his back. I've said it to his face. I've said it, you know, to anybody that asked me about the, him and his family and just great people. So big shout out to you guys. And I appreciate you. Uh, appreciate your friendship for sure. Yeah. And we, oh, uh, yeah, we, we, we appreciate the call Craig and uh, appreciate the support of the show. You've been a supporter of this show for a long time and uh, looking, yeah, no, looking forward to yeah. getting together and hunting with you ourselves, me and Jeff. Yeah, that, that'd be great. We, uh, I wish I could have, I got my times crossed and didn't get in till late. I was wanting to listen the whole thing, but we. But uh, well, that's the beauty of the archive. Last little bit, and I'll definitely listen to it tomorrow too at work. So, and, and Junior wanted me to tell you he said hi too. So okay. Well, hello, Junior. I appreciate it, man. You guys are awesome. Tell him I'll find some more marbles for him. <laughs> I will. I will. Hey, thanks for the fine Lois some call too. Give him a hard time real quick. Yeah. You bet. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, thanks for the call. See you, Craig. Do you think I've lost my marbles, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, Rick, and you find <laughs> Lloyd something. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, he wants to be a bull rider one time, you know, and that's that's how you become a bull rider. You put take a mouthful of marbles and you spit one out each time you get on a bull. <laughs> By the time you've lost all your marbles, you become a bull rider. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. Hey, you've been a great guest, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Hang on, and uh, we'll say our goodbyes after we close the show out. And, Jeff, I'll let you have okay. your say, and then I'll go on from there. Yeah, thanks for everybody that's uh, in the chat and all the callers. I mean, it's it's uh, we do this for you. And uh, thanks, Rick, for being such a great guest. And uh, thanks, Mark Hoover, for uh, ha- uh, getting you as a guest. So, but anyway, well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and then uh, God bless and have a good night. Okay, and guys, next week we've got Clay Copeland of Brute Magnetics as our guest. This is going to be a great show. There's some things that uh, I think are in the works that you're going to want to hear about uh, Brute Magnets, and that's that's really, really popular right now. So uh, come back next week and listen to that. Also, check out Beyond Sight and Sound with Josh Kimmel every Sunday night and Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, All Metal Mode with Mike Hare and Gypsy Jewels. Monday night at 8 o'clock, American Digger Relic Roundup with Butch Holcomb, Jeff Lubert, and myself. Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. Hardcore Metal Detecting with our buddies Derek Asklar and Craig Talley. Thursday and Saturday at 8 o'clock Eastern. And by the way, they're having some uh, morning uh, coffee shows. I don't know the exact days on those. I think it's Monday and Wednesday and maybe on Friday every now and then. Uh, Just check their site, Hardcore Metal Detecting. And then also XP Team USA with Dave Kimball and Grant Hansen. Have a show every other Friday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. And me and Jeff will be right back here with uh, clay copeland and uh, brute magnetics next thursday night eight o'clock eastern we'll see you then Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Relics Radio. We really do appreciate it. Be sure and join us live every Thursday night at 8 o'clock Eastern here on Spreaker, or you can catch the archive show at Relics Radio on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and many other podcast outlets. Relics Radio is also syndicated on the Cutting Edge Radio Network and is broadcast around the world. 
Please take a minute and hit the like button and be sure and follow us so you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming broadcasts. You can also find us on YouTube at Digging with Seven or Tennessee Jeff, or you can check us out on our Relics Radio Facebook group page or Adventures in History on Facebook. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then send an email to relicsradio at outlook.com. We'd love to hear from you. We hope that you'll join us next Thursday night. And until then, get out there and dig some history.